This is the Lekker Rugby Pod with Harry Jones and MV Velman. It's the Lekker Rugby Pod, episode 9. And uh, it's time to chat to Harry about this ongoing debate whether Antoine Dupont is uh, Antoine Dupont. He's a GOAT or the greatest of all time. So, Harry, you've got something to say about that. How's it? <laughs> How's it, MV? Yeah, it's funny how everything, it, it comes down to this idea that, that people from the North, and sorry, from the North, uh, we don't think of you as one monolith. We know that there's various people in the North who think different things, but it still originates from a Northern perspective of now we can say he is the GOAT. And um, I don't think we're even close to being that point, and I'm happy to talk methodically and rigorously um, through that. Uh, and I think at the end, if you're fair-minded, you go, oh, you know, I see that. And we'll all calm down and put our the fire out in our hairs. Um, look, first of all, I think straw man argumentation is very common in every family. Um, you know, people use argumentation. So you want the kids to die, you know, whatever that kind of stuff. No, 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 no. We're not saying that. And also, we're not saying that um, in any way Antoine Dupont is a bad player or a marginal player or just an okay player. He's actually bloody good. Uh, but to be, you know, the greatest of all time in your position is an unbelievably lofty conversation, which requires, uh, most of the time, it takes a career. Before we go any further, the reason why we're discussing this, obviously because the sevens uh, was just f- finalized in, in the Olympics, but more, more importantly, you've, you've written an article for the Raw that's going to be published when? I come out um, Tuesday morning, South African time, European time. Yeah, with a pretty, and uh, yo, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna feature some straw man arguments. We're gonna go through them one by one. Um, look, it's if there was a time to talk about the great play, magnificent play, um, and bear in mind, it always seems to be about attacking play. You know, defensive play and the balance of time and winning doesn't seem to go into the conversation of go. It's usually about highlights because we became a highlight uh, culture even in rugby. It's a weird thing to do it post sevens. I would think the pinnacle of Antoine Dupont's career was in the championship, Champions Cup, uh, challenge, Champions Cup final, where at the end of AT, he was looking at a drop goal from Frawley. Remember that guy, Frawley? Mm. Kieran Frawley? And if it had Big gone show. over, we would be having a very different conversation. That would have been the key, you know, to saying is Gibson Park, Jameson Gibson Park, one of the top scrum offs of the last five years. And uh, I do think it's odd to do it from whatever it was, four minutes in a wide open game, because you always imagine would, would Will Jordan, Ari Savea, and Mark Talay look pretty good in sevens? Oh, I bet they would. <laughs> I, bet, I bet if you gave someone like Grant Williams that much space and just said, run around everyone, uh, there would be some highlights. Sevens is a training drill. Um, it's, you know, the Olympics use it as a format instead of the 15s game to be an Olympic medal. But I mean, there's a big difference between which teams put investment in and who's using the top players. Uh, you could imagine, you know, Chess and Colby having a pretty good day in sevens if he wanted it. You mentioned uh, re- uh, recency bias by another name, but the point is that now suddenly because he's, he's playing across two codes, he must now be elevated to the, one of the greatest. So might I remind people about, for example, one Kirky Aronser having played for this blitz box. Jesslyn Colby having played for the Blitzbox, Quacha Smith having played for the Blitzbox. So the fact that you can play in two different codes and do well at both of them doesn't necessarily guarantee you GOAT status, am I mistaken? No. So, you know, to, to be the best in your position over the life of your career, over a 10-year period, is very difficult because it depends not only on style, coaching, a bit of luck, but also durability. I mean, before you like walk by people like George Gregan or U.S. Van der Vestesen or um, any number of scrum offs and just like blissfully unaware of them, uh, I think, you know, Fruit Dupree and Aaron Smith has something to say. Let's just take the case of Aaron Smith before we go too crazy about um, our friend Dupont. So Aaron Smith played almost his entire career for a really terrible club or a club that underperformed. The Highlanders down in Dunedin, 185 appearances for a team where he was getting his arse handed to him behind a pack that was crumbling. Uh, Aaron Smith uh, was able to do that and have a glittering career in the All Blacks and be the number one person written down by three or four different coaches. No question, Aaron Smith was right written down there. And he wasn't allowed to play his full career because if you play outside New Zealand, you don't get picked anymore. So he'd still be going. He's 35. How did he get picked was because he does the pass, 
the rugby pass, the spiral. Uh, Aaron Smith could kill a flea on the corner of the sleeve of, of an All Black uh, running outside him, three or four channels away. That ball not only would go like a bullet, it would be tilted slightly upwards so as to be caught easier. DuPont has never thrown <laughs> one good pass as good as Aaron Smith's. I'm not discounting Aaron, uh, Antoine DuPont's full court game. He's like a flank back. He's like a, he loves contact. He can do other things that Aaron cannot do. I'm just saying, what is the one thing that a scrum off does more than any other thing on a pitch? Pass the ball. What is the whole team geared on when you have quick ruck and you want to be able to win like the All Blacks during 2012 to 2018? One of the greatest uh, sporting runs, dynasties of sports. They had incredibly quick ruck ball. Who was responsible for that? Forwards, yes, but also Aaron Smith because he was at the base. He's able to pass a ball without any deviation in his shoulders. His head stays down. His follow through tells you where the ball is going to go, but it doesn't matter that you know where it's going to go because you cannot get there in time. You can go to Conrad Smith, Sonny Bill Williams, outside channel, uh, Jerome Kano, uh, Kieran Reed. Do you think all those players only had time because they were so good? Aaron Nugget Smith. He can uh, he can do it with no wobble. So that smooth thief of time, the person who takes away time from defense, was Smith. Um, if you want to rank a scrum off, you look at Aaron Smith and say. Uh, at age 28, he had 50 All Black Caps. He had won a World Cup. Um, he never dabbled in sevens, really, that I know of. But I think he would have been pretty good at sevens. Uh, by 2018, it was the most capped scrum off. And so he has one and a half times, twice as much caps as DuPont. With um, And he played the, the ferocious British and Irish Lions, one of the best versions of them. He was up against the box. At times, the box were almost unplayable for everyone else during that time period. And he put them away. Uh, he has a 70 cap gap on DuPont um, and he can play in certain ways that I think DuPont cannot. So I think before we just throw Smith away and pretend he doesn't exist, um, we want DuPont to stand the test of time. First and foremost, let's give the man, he has 50 caps. Let's give the man a hundred. Let's give him 90. Let's see in Australia in 2027. Let's see him win more than one Six Nations in a seven-year period because that's all he's got. I think one, you've raised so many points there. I, need, I keep my head together to make sure I touch on all of them. The first one that you mentioned <laughs> was that uh, Aaron Smith, for example, played against British, Irons Lions, British and Irish Lions in New Zealand. Antoine de Pont is not keen to go down to New Zealand and go, te to go be tested there. He's once again not going to go there. It looks like France is not going to send the team there. He's never won a World Cup. It's a very important point that we need to discuss. And also importantly, you discussed the, the technical ability of a scrum off like uh, like an Aaron Smith now, for example. If we want to rate it, uh, 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 decide whether someone has the greatest of all time or not, do we decide whether he's now the first, the greatest rugby player of all time or the greatest scrum off of all time? And if, let's say for argument's sake, we say scrum off. Do we then look at technical ability and then we, 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 we rate them against each other? Like you said, Smith has got this pass. What is... Antoine de Pont have as a scrum off that makes him stand out so much, apart from the fact that he just seems to be a good rugby player overall? That's a really good question. Um, I do think all those variables play a part. If you're talking about technical ability and you say clearly that there's certain things a person can do, I don't know, line out ability, scrum ability by a prop, um, it's a little bit easier to put side by side. If it's about total um uh, leadership, winability, influence on a game, which is what I think DuPont's uh, assertion rests on. He's clearly not the best player in the world right now, and he's clearly not the best player of all time. That's sort of laughable, right? Uh, that's dead on arrival. If we just a modicum of scientific analysis to this, that falls away. But is he the best right now in the Northern Hemisphere? That's a decent argument. And it re that rests mostly on club. Um, the problem with club, when you can put it, compare it to test, and I call it the Raymond rule, is yes, the European Championship Cups are good, but you still have players in the field like Raymond Rule who look okay. And they don't look okay at test level. They get run around and miss seven tackles. Mm -hmm. So when you want to see how good winnability is, you say, could he own the Irish? If the French played the British and Irish Lions, they would get their arses handed to them uh, in the three-game three, uh, three game series. That is not the case against the Box or the All Blacks. Uh, the Lions have a better winning record against New Zealand and South Africa than their in constituent parts do. The Lions are always better than just Ireland or just England. Whoever says the opposite, just look at the numbers. 
But if the if if the French cannot even beat the Irish straight up, uh, they would get overwhelmed by the Lions. So so we have to then. That's how we also kind of compare Dupont to Smith or Farid de Priya because we actually have a more of a benchmark against the British and Irish Lions. We do go to test rugby for this reason is because to lose has a much greater margin of quality and depth and a payroll uh, over the other clubs than maybe only a few, La Rochelle, uh, Leinster. Whereas when you go to the test level and you have a proper, you know, four four times, uh, one time before every four years where everyone's fit, everyone's got the best available coaching and you can actually see head to head, it's not the be all and end all because it would disqualify every player from outside five teams. You know, a Tongan could never get there unless they moved to New Zealand and became an All Black, like Jonah Lomu. And even he lost uh, in the World Cup, but we still consider him as one of the greats. So there's a pathway where you can get to GOAT status without winning a World Cup, but it's more difficult, counterintuitively, if you come from New Zealand, South Africa, England, France, or, or um, New Zealand, because you're expected to do well in the World Cup there. It's a problem if you have a home quarterfinal in France with the favorites, pre-tournament favorites, and you don't win. And the reason why you don't win, in large part, depends on you. Antoine Dupont, at the end of the quarterfinal, was standstill. He was waving his arms. He was preparing his excuses about a referee. He sometimes was putting up a lame grubber. He should have come off. You would never have said... Ibn Etzebeth should have come off at the end. He was looking like he could play 20 more minutes. He was besting. Ibn Etzebeth was besting Dupont. So at lock was playing better than a scrum off at the end of that quarterfinal because that's where you see true greatness when someone just takes on a match and says, I'll do everything. You know, I went back and looked at my praises of what Ibn Etzebeth did that day, and it was insane. And no one would ever laugh at you if they said, Ibn Etzebeth is in the conversation for a possible uh, goat. Why? Because... We have seen him before take on charge down, scoop backs, monstering three guys taken to the try line. Where was that in the final 10, 20 minutes of the quarterfinal on the most important match of his life? So we do look at those matches because that's where we can see all excuses to the side, no benefit of a two lose pack against a weaker pack. Um, you're at home. You're, you're in front of the drunkest, loudest, craziest, most certain crowd ever. Uh, the stars have aligned. And uh, you got bested by a combination of Kubas Reinach and Faf de Klerk. I'm not putting Faf or Kubas above him. I'm saying that your greatness didn't allow you to get over that. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you would have been better off off. Like you take Dupont off, the French might have won that game. That's bizarre to say about a goat. So he's not a goat. Um, he's not a goat yet. Now, the yet parts are interesting because he has another chance. He has he has four more Six Nations. He should at least, at least win two of those, probably three. And then he should go deeper into the World Cup. Does he have to win? I don't think so. What if what if the French get to the final in Australia and they lose by a point, but Dupont's clearly the best player on the on the pitch? Okay, you know, revive the argument. What if by that time he has 100 caps, 85, 90 caps, and he's done even more superlative things? Okay, the length of time, consistency. Uh, but it is preposterous to erect a straw man argument that you say, you only will believe he's the best if he wins a World Cup. No, we're not saying that. We're saying that's the only forum in which your relative merit is tested to the nth degree, where the vice is tight, where everyone's nuts are up in a you know a nice curly ball. And you have to see, does Ibn Etzebeth mind that? No, he's going to take you over the trial line with three guys on him. He's scooping the ball back in space. And he looks like he can defend the third channel at 79 minutes as a big lock. That's a guy in a go conversation. So you talked about the Toulouse game, the, the final for the Champions Cup against Leinster, and then you talked about the, the, the quarterfinal against South Africa, for example. And uh, the difference being that for the first 80 minutes before Frawley, until Frawley missed that drop kick, which would, would have won them the game, the Irish pack was weaker than Toulouse's pack because, like you said, you know, the best that money can buy kind of an argument, which is exactly what it was. Nevertheless, Gibson Park outshone DuPont on the day. So we're talking about what combos can mean to a player, what, what a com combination of, a, of, of, of two or three players can, can, mean, can mean to a team. The point is, if you have someone like Eben, 
they can win you the game regardless of what's happening around them. Where if the stars don't align for DuPont, then he doesn't shine. And then once again, to me, that's a disqualification. It means that even Etzebeth, even if we were on a you know on a hiding bound for nothing, he would he would have still made a difference in terms of what he as a player can bring. And now we're comparing a lot to his come off, I know, but that's where it comes into into it for me <laughs> over a period of time. Not per game. You can't compare, say, he played well in this final or badly in that final. That makes him good or bad. Like you just said, over the ex the career, the entire career, what difference did it make? Would you think that Eben Etzebeth made a bigger difference over a period of time? Yes, I would. Do I think Frida Priya made a bigger difference over a period of time? Yes, I do. Do I think Aaron Smith made a bigger difference? I'm just quoting Scrum Offs now. But more importantly, do I think Richie McCall made a bigger difference over the course of his career? Yes, I did. Again, like you said, right in the beginning, remember, it's only in the middle of his career now. So we're not comparing people that have finished their careers. We know exactly what they've achieved compared to him. We're not sure what he can achieve yet. You've mentioned that before. So it's too early to call him a GOAT, but I think even on the evidence of where he is in his career, he's, he's got a bit of an uphill battle, if you ask me. So what what makes a scrum off really good is you look at his fly off and you say did he make his fly off better? So Jameson Gibson Park and Connor Murray, um, in some ways contributed to Johnny Sexton having one of the most amazing careers. When you look at Dan Carter, you wonder who was service you know who was serving him uh, the ball. Well, you look at Aaron Smith and you say would Dan Carter have been as good a fly off? He would have been good, but would he have been as good a fly off if he didn't have that extra you know point five? Um, I think Jameson Gibson Park is in the conversation for being the best scrum off in the last five years in the Northern Hemisphere. And the problem with Jameson Gibson Park is he's, he's kind of a, a player who makes people around him better. And I, I accuse in some ways of DuPont making the people around him not as good in a strange way. And here's why. They're so dupondent on him that, you know, their number 10s kind of shrink. So, you know, whether it's Jalibert or if it's um, uh, Intermac. In a way, they take less, fewer and fewer kicks from uh, the field. They don't develop their incisive cuts. And then when when you really can tie up DuPont, like Faf did in the quarterfinal, or in some cases they've done uh, uh, in the Challenge Cup, in the Champions Cup, then his team sort of fades because they don't know where to go. And so I don't – like which Richie McCall is such a good example, by the way. Richie McCall made everyone around him better. Um, you always knew that he would be taking the best line to the ruck. So I think with Jameson Gibson Park, he's not as much of a human highlight reel as DuPont, mm. but he's so good at taking uh, routes to the ruck. Um, and he doesn't do many errors. So in rugby, if you want highlight reels, you always you know look at the thing that worked. But what about the things that didn't work? Being caught behind the ruck by Ibn three times in the quarterfinal and leading to a try to Colby. Um, what about the uh, terrible kicks that he made? You know, like, so Jameson Gibson Park is one of those guys who doesn't give you much. And so he's, he's hard to play against. In the 2024 uh, championships con uh, Championship Cup, Cup Final, I thought Gibson Park won his personal duel with DuPont in the first 80 minutes because it was DuPont standing under his poles wondering if for all these drop goal would go just mm. two inches this way or that way. He had to wait and watch. Um, and who, who had given him, who had given Frawley that opportunity? Gibson Park. Who took away DuPont's, uh, you know, certain try? Um, uh, Gibson Park. This is relevant because, you know, in the end, the bigger pack won and all that. But in their personal duel, I thought Gibson Park had it. So I'm not saying Gibson Park is better than DuPont. I'm saying it's not clear that DuPont's better than Gibson Park in the actual matches played in the Six Nations. One title for France, three for Ireland. Lost three years, two out of three for Ireland. So why should I deem DuPont for that, right? Well, it's because he is the cog around which the French play. You could actually say Gibson Park is the most valuable player in 2024 Six Nations and one of the most in 2023. So I think you're looking at two very different kind of players, but I don't think that they that uh, DuPont has settled his personal duel with a Gibson Park, and then he gets to jump over him and forget Aaron Smith. I think there's people on the park right now who are playing still that deserve more respect than that. I think it's yet to be determined, and I think DuPont needs more victories over Ireland with Gibson Park on the field where you actually say, I know who the best nine was on that game. Yeah, but there's a thing called selective perception. And that's when you start thinking about a car, buying a car, then you suddenly see only that car on the road. It's all you notice. 
So when you start thinking about Antoine Dupont being the greatest of all play, all you see is Antoine Dupont. But, and like you just mentioned, when you mentioned the word highlights, that's what I realized. The guy who does the work in the background and does makes everybody look good, but without whom the team wouldn't be who they are, Gibson Park. Off the Clare to a degree, you know, uh, Aaron Smith, definitely. Um, that's where the difference comes in. DuPont is in, uh, at the forefront of everybody's uh, minds at the moment. He's, he's drawing the most attention. He's the most talked about. And that's one of the reasons selective perception why he's now suddenly seen as being one of the, the greatest of all time. I think to a degree that plays a, a big role. He's a much more flashy player, much more in your face. And like I said, now everybody talks about him. Everybody notices him. I think that's a lot of what this conversation is about. It's just too early. You know, um, my friends in northern Mexico prepare a wonderful dish called the cabrito. It's the baby goat. The baby goat that's roasted to perfection. Apparently it came from the Moorish uh, people who moved there during uh, Isabella Spain's uh, rebellion or whatever. And it's beautiful. It's succulent. I actually think Dupont is the cabrito. He's not the goat yet. He's the baby goat. And does the baby goat grow up into the big billy goat? Let's see. Let's wait. Let's give it some time. I guess the one thing that is weird for us, uh, when I say us, who am I talking about? Probably probably All Blacks and Springbok supporters, but to some extent Pacific Islanders in general, because the Tongan, Samoan, and Fijian players, I mean, there might be the best players in the world inside some of those teams over the 40, mm. 50 years. They just didn't get to win enough games or be on TV enough. But, I mean, you know, you just just take a look at that. Just watch yeah. Lavani Botia play and go, well, maybe he would be the GOAT. I don't know. But I think... We think right now they're getting ahead of themselves and we wonder why there's such vociferous assertions mm. and people that are generally, I think, well-meaning and fair-minded and nice fellas. Why are they getting on and getting angry, like vehemently arguing with themselves, um, erecting these straw men and burning them down with a, a flamethrower? I'm like, no one's actually said any of these things. Like, I mean, there might be some people who say these things, but my argument's not that he has to win a World Cup is that I don't know if too many 50 cap players who haven't achieved much success in terms of winning trophies at the test level who get to say they're a GOAT when there are real live amazing players who had a whole career already who did do those things and stood up on the highest of pressure and played better or for longer periods of time. Like just calm the F down. Okay, Ari, we've tried our best to be as... Um objective and um, impartial as we could possibly be. But are you telling me we know who the greatest is or is it still up for debate? No, we don't know. That's the thing. The essence of good intellectual thought is uh, doubt. And you sometimes don't know how careers look until later. But I, there's no way you could pick. You can pick across eras because you can bank on the fact that certain um, top players, like they took Bobby Jones's swing in golf and they analyzed it against equipment today. He'd be fine. He'd do well. He's, it was his competitive champion's outlook. So Martin Johnson would do well. Uh, Fricky Dupria, Colin Mead. You would imagine they would adjust to whatever the nutrition was of the day. Mm. It's harder from position to position. So we shouldn't have a goat. There should be basically, it's a goat. It's a t uh, 15 goats. And you would like try to argue within each position. But we don't even know that. I'm saying Ibn Etzabeth has a much better argument than Antoine Dupont right now. 122 caps as a bot clock, the position that South Africans produce the most of. Uh, Three-time three cup starter with the worst finish being a two-point loss in the rain to Dan Carter. One of the best all-black teams ever. A back-to-back -back winner. Uh, most valuable forward in a forward-orientated pitch. But we still wouldn't even say, I would never try to thrust down the throat of all the Northern Hemisphere guys, Etzabeth is the best, because I don't even know if he's better than uh, Sam Whitelock at this point in time in my mind. I don't know if he's better than um, Bucky's Buerta. I don't know. I don't know. The point is you don't know, but he's in the conversation. Um, as the Guardian put it on that day uh, in the quarterfinal, Etzebeth was a monstrous presence in the darkened recesses and around the fringes, terrorizing Antoine Dupont. So even with all that, I don't say, so you have to say, and if you don't say that Ibn Etzebeth is the best luck of all time, you are stupid. I just say that it's obvious that Ibn Etzebeth is one of the best locks of all time. Therefore, he's one of the, he's in the GOAT conversation for locks. But a GOAT of all rugby, of all positions, what a weird thing to say. It's almost like you don't understand rugby. Uh, so I think the jury is still out on that, and I think it should stay out forever in some ways. But for sure, um, uh, DuPont has an opportunity here to get himself into the conversation as the goat of the Northern Hemisphere, as the goat of European rugby, 
as possibly down the road, the goat of the Six Nations. He ain't there yet. And, uh, you know, there's a long way to work to catch uh, and tie the shoelaces of Aaron Smith. Yeah. Well, for me, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So like you said, since 2017, one Six Nations title. Uh, a couple of Champions Cup titles with a team that, like I said, it's the best that money can buy effectively. And even this year, um, uh, if it wasn't for a drop goal, a couple of inches to the left or to the right, you know, it could have turned out completely differently. Yeah, no, like I said, come come down to the Southern Hemisphere, play a couple of games here against the tough All Black or Springbok or Australian side for that matter, and we'll have it. We'll, we'll talk again. It's up for discussion. And it's just a bit of a, I'm going to catch you a bit offside here, but um, I got the, had the pleasure of uh, 40 minutes of, of torture and then 40 minutes of exquisite pleasure <laughs> at Loftus last night, <laughs> watching the game, watching us lose. And I was sitting next to Ken Boland and we were joking still. So, yeah, now after the Lions lost against the Sharks, the Bulls are now the only unbeaten team in the Curry Cup. And during the game, you said to me, you, want, you might want to revisit that thought of yours that you had at the beginning of the game. And then the Bulls came back with a bang. Oh. Um, and I seeing, you, seeing it, you're a Western Province supporter. I just had to know, what did you think of that guy? <laughs> uh, I just, emotion. ever since the guy in Pretoria told me about emotional hedging, I'm using emotional hedging about uh, any such game. Now, anytime you see such a turnaround, what was it, like 47 to 7 or something, there was a run by the Bulls three. to come and seize it. 27-3. Yeah. All right. Craziness, like you know, uh, it's almost like you know the proverbial two matches in one match. Um, now, look to me, the Curry Cup does matter. The Curry Cup is the envy of the world, actually, because that level, that tier, is so crucial. But it does sometimes lead to some very weird results that um, have a hard time <laughs> computing. I think inherently, it's one of those uh, competitions where you have mismatches all over the field, and so you can have runs. You can have you can score twenty, thirty sometimes because you just have a strange comp combination on the field. But, you know, all power to the Bulls. Uh, they got something going on. Uh, I think it's very good for Safa Rugby to have a good North and a good South, a strong North, a strong South. Uh, the rivalry has to be spicy. I think for a while there, it was almost much, too much our way. You know, it was almost like in the in the, in the Irk, I mean. Mm -hmm. And I think having it all these different levels, whether it's under 20s, whether it's uh, Curry Cup, whether it's Irk, I think it's brilliant. And long may it continue. Yeah, even at school's level, man. It's even, yeah, it just goes, yeah. Goes, it goes as low as that. The point I'm, I'm making, you're saying, yeah, the North has to be strong and the South has to be strong. The North is coming along nicely. The South seems to be losing, losing their way a little bit, don't you think? <laughs> Rubbing it in. Sasha. <laughs> Yeah. Ben I, Jason. <laughs> Harry, watch this space. Watch the Sasha space. I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll see. Oh, now, the point, I'm trying to make is, yeah. the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make is that's going to happen. You, you said the other day, his dad is uh, <laughs> adamant he stays in Cape Town. The point I'm trying to make is the Bulls want to do well in URC and in the Champions Cup. And they're doing this by getting the, the next level of players to be on the same level as, as the almost the same level as the first team, first choices, where the other teams are all look, looking to develop the under 18s and under 19, 19s, and, and and you know there's okay, it's a nice experiment and everything, and gives them a bit of uh, you know a bit of opportunity to play, but it doesn't benefit the team in the longer run. I think the Bulls have got the right approach here, and we'll see the fruits of this during the course of the next season. Lots more depth and proper depth, not just depth in numbers, but depth in quality. I think is what we're going to be seeing here. Yeah, it's like an, a replicant version of the box setup. And we'll talk on Thursday about depth charts and how you build them and the sacrifices you have to make and the um, sometimes the things that surprise your fan base. I think the Bulls are doing some of that. Uh, probably there's some moments in the last two years where the Bulls fans were kind of a little bit miffed. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? I think I think you have to have that structure in place uh, with enough wins along the way that no one's getting too mad at you, but you have to build depth and uh, you know, I can't fault you there. I think so Western province, I think we just uh, always will always have had a churning talent base that regardless of how many get plucked off to Pretoria or Tokyo or whatever in Ireland, there's always another. And um, that can become a bit of a crutch and it could become a, you can be almost like fool's mm -hmm. gold because it's the, um, the cohesion, right, that you mm -hmm. have to build. Uh, we know about these guys down in Australia, Gainline Analytics, uh, Ben Darwin and his friend Simon, that always talk about that interstitial relationship you have that's hard to put in words. But if you can play with someone for seven seasons in a row, <laughs> you really do know. 
um, how they play. So the Bulls are building something that is probably a little bit better right now. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. I just wanted to get that in there. You know, we don't typically talk about the Karika, but you know, the <laughs> yeah. Bulls keep this <laughs> problems are hiding. I mean, it has to be talked about. <laughs> Just for the glee factor, if I can call it that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially after the way we almost uh, come a day away. where Yeah. yeah but come a day when you're wearing the blue and white the blue and white hoops and then yeah. we'll know something happened right the day now that wearing light blue to honor you guys. The day that happens, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm being held hostage for something. Something's wrong. I'll roll my eyes like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blink twice. <laughs> I think we have, we have, I wanted to ask you something else. Now, we, we were joking the other day about what these professional rugby players would, would do. And we were talking about that one specific picture of the uh, of his first team a couple of years ago. And one of the two, two of the guys stood out there. One was Pierre Schumann, and the other one was Ergis Neyman. And we started joking around what would these guys have been doing? Ergis Neyman, for example, <laughs> if he wasn't a professional rugby player. Tell us about that. What, what Arche would be if he wasn't a professional rugby player? I swear, MV, I think it's all an act. I think uh, Achia is not this br- blunt force trauma Viking guy that he appears to do, shaving off everyone's hair. I would picture him going a different way, probably a tenured professor <laughs> at Trinity College in Dublin, robed, specializing in Scandinavian philosophy and mm. the ancient hairstyles of Nordic warriors or something, uh, eating locks on his bagels. Uh, they would probably nickname him Cannibal Lecture. Um Yo, I think seriously, Archie is an intellectual posing as a bully. Look at his uh, his interviews. Uh, I, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but he says things like, we take that role seriously, you know. Maybe next game you'll be in the Bob squad. That's such philosophy. I mean, he's basically just turning the question around and and it's Archaeism. I, I, I accuse him of being a philosopher. Mm. I can picture it. I mean, the tweed jacket going to have to be specially made because nothing else will fit. And then the, you know, the rounds of the Harry Potter glasses and those long, that long hair like he had in the beginning. I remember when he started playing rugby, he didn't have this weird mohawk thing. He had this long, this long locks and like a typical professor. I can actually see it, you know, strolling along the campus with the books under the arm, you know, musing away about whatever Archimedes, <laughs> Plato. The most popular, something. the most popular professor of all, right? He would be yeah. the most popular uh, yeah. philosopher of yeah, I like all. that one. Sorry, I want another one. Give me another one. What about um, Damien Dialenda? Dukes. Uh, you know how every, every good club, every rugby club has that guy, the guy who's in the clubhouse a little bit early and a little bit late, and you start to wonder, and then you realize he's actually sleeping in there with the balls and the posters about believe and dominate. He's back there with the cones, you know? The same is true of nightclubs. So I swear, Dukes would be a guy who worked in a nightclub, but, you know, but actually lived there. Uh, not just for money, just to live in the back, you know, to pretend to be a bouncer, live off oranges, oranges and olives, and and uh, meet girls in the the bouncer, you know, line, um, and still look exactly like Dukes. In fact, nothing would change that much. He'd just be in a nightclub. He must have a mustache. Though. <laughs> he was, was same mustache. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Enough of the frivolity. This is a serious channel, serious pod. This one we have to. We'll talk about some more. <laughs> but like you just mentioned, on Thursday, we're going to be talking about our dev squad. We've been talking about that for a while now, the dev chart. Um, you know, who's going to be in the 2027 squad? And for that, we have to do a bit of deep diving. You know, what style are we going to be playing? And who's going to be there? Who's going to be too old? Who's going to be the new talent coming through and everything else? So I think people must, must watch out for that one. We'll post it on Thursday afternoon. You'll have a look. We'll, we'll let you know. Yeah, cool. I'll do some research. I love Twitter X. My friends on Twitter X are always, you know, really quick to point out even, you know, one little semicolon uh, correction. And by, I think by a third or fourth iteration, we've kind of got the final Mm -hmm. final. Not what we think, not what we prefer, but what we think Rossi and co are actually trying to bed in for the 2027 Mm -hmm. Rugby World Cup. Yeah, I think there's a pattern emerging, but yeah, that's that's for another day. Okay, Ari, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Talk soon. This is the Lekker Rugby Pod with Harry Jones and MV Avelman.